So good evening, friends. Hope I'm audible to you all. Yes, sir. Okay. So we are an Indian national movement and uh, we saw the what led to the Indian national movement. What are the causes to the growth of nationalism in India? What led? First thing, the Indians understood that colonial interest is different from what Indian interests are. And the only major cause for India's backwardness was what? The interest of colonists, British, was to make Indian economy into colonial economy. And what led to the cause of uh, nationalism was the British brought uh, uh, united political, administrative, economic, all the unification. When they brought unification of political, economic, and administrative unification, along with a unified judiciary, unified judiciary, and codified law, which is both civil law and criminal law. Well, writing is not visible. Writing is not visible. One minute, please. Can you see? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So you have what? Political, administrative, economic unification of the country along with the unified judiciary, codified civil and criminal laws. When this was done, all it helped in what? When, when British brought this kind of a political, administrative, economic unification along with judiciary law and criminal and civil laws, it unified and helped what? It helped India to, it helped India. In what way it helped India? Please tell me. Did India was one nation before the arrival of the British in India? Hmm? Is India was one nation? No, sir. It was a group of 500, more than 500 to uh, princely states. That is, that is during the independence time, you have more than 563 princely states which merged into the Union of India by Sardar Patel, who was the first uh, uh, deputy prime minister and home minister of the country. So yes, he was. But prior to that, uh, unification and you can say from arrival of British or the Europeans was India one nation? No sir. India was not one nation though it was an empire under the Mughals. Under the Mughals each uh, what you call land was divided among what? Mansabdar and Jagirdar. Yes or no? And that brought the Jagirdari crisis and these Jagirdars were what? Feudal lords. Yes or no? Yes, sir. When Britishers came, what led to the growth of modern nationalism is that political, administrative, economic unification of the country along with what? Professional civil services plus you can see unified judiciary, codified laws, criminal and civil laws all along with modern means of transport communication all helped what it helped india what it helped politically unified yes or no it politically unified 
it as a nation. What led to the political unification of the Indian subcontinent? What led? The British administrative, political, economic, professional civil service, codified, unified judiciary, codified civil and criminal laws, transport, communication, all held India to be unified as a one political entity. Are you getting? Are you able to understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. So you can see that what led to the uh, factors that led to growth of Indian national movement or growth of modern nationalism is also the education. How can you say education? Because you can see when uh, Indians went abroad, they went to Australia, UK, New Zealand, or to the or to the other European countries. They were educated, and when they were educated, they also were exposed to the Western political thought. Western political thought and its education system. When its education system, Indians were, were uh, what you called, were exposed, then what is the uh, issue? Now we can see students were led into what kind of thinking? Liberal and radical thinking. Liberal and radical thinking. If liberal and radical thinking means what? They questioned and they compared Indian scenario with what? The British scenario. With the United Kingdom scenario. So they saw how the, the Britishers have developed their own country well. And, and they had very big institutions, self-governing institutions. They had technology. They have uh, what you called uh, much better communication and and uh, transport system. And uh, they had what you called the in West, they had this modern uh, thoughts. What are the modern thoughts? They got imbibed with what? The, uh, this education, Western thought helped to imbibe in what? It, it, they imbibed what? They imbibed modern rational, secular, democratic, and nationalistic ideas. They got what ideas? Modern ideas, rational ideas, secular ideas, democratic ideas, nationalistic ideas. So what helped them to imbibe these ideas? Education. And what kind of education? Modern Western education. Western, Western education. Okay. So when they got this, it led to the, they compared this with Indian scenario. And because of that, and also after 1857, there were big universities opened in Madras, Calcutta, and Bombay. What universities? Universities had come. And this university is also led to the spread of colleges. And these colleges were affiliated to universities and students were exposed. They also also thought, and this helped them. And what was predominantly taught in this uh, colleges in which language? In English language. When English language was taught, it became the link language all over. India, same administrative system, same economic, political, judiciary, civil services, codified laws, transport, communication. So everywhere English language was there. And this language helped different regions of country which spoke different languages. And they came, utilized these transport, communication, and they spoke in English language, which became what? Exchange of ideas. And, and they also understood the situation what the Indians are facing. And these middle class intelligentsia 
prior to 1857 revolt, they were hoping that they will be getting what kind of jobs, private jobs or government jobs, middle class intelligentsia. Government jobs, sir. So government jobs and and administrative or civil services jobs they were looking. But did they get, did middle class intelligentsia get what they have desired? Did they utilize their services? No. So if they, if their services are utilized, was their education a waste? No, sir. So what they did, they used their uh, language, communication, their learnings, everything. They become the critic of the British rule. And you can see Ramesh Chandra Dutt, what he does, Ramesh Chandra Dutt, he wrote the economic history of India. Yes or no? Yes, sir. So, so this economic history of India, he could be very much, uh, very, very, um, what he called calculatively, he uh, uh, made an assessment how from 18, so from 1757, British has systematically exploited exploited the Indians commercially, economically, and they had made uh, India backward because of their policies, and they have plundered the Indian wealth and made their home country, England, rich. So they put all these ideas, and they become the first press people, journalists. So they start, they use this press and literature effectively against what dissemination of ideas what did did they use they used to disseminate or dissemination of modern ideas as well as they informed indians what happened because of british rule how indians once upon a time they were all very rich and during Aurangzeb time, India was the largest manufacturing sector and richest country in the world. But you can see people now slowly started to understand that British is the main cause for the economic backwardness and the poverty. And people are dying of hunger and, and artificially created. And this helped people to unite and criticize the British government. Okay. So this helped press and literature also helped in what? In raising the national consciousness or growth of modern nationalism. And, and it also led to the rise of Indian national movement. Just I'm recapping. And, and Max Muller Max Muller Sir William Jones, Asiatic Society of Bengal, 1784. All their Indological studies and even uh, you can see uh, the Europeans, the scholars who came to India, European scholars, they went and discovered and dug and they brought this theory of Aryan genealogy. This Aryan genealogy and it put what? The seed that Indians, particularly the Brahmins or Aryans who came to India and Europeans both shared common ancestry. Both shared common ancestry so this brought this brought pride in the brahmins and that they now what they were searching for is that now they can what equate themselves equally equate themselves equally to the british so this gave lot of pride in the upper caste and they also started to uh, what you called fight the history that white man's burden. What is the white man's burden? To educate the uneducated. Not only that, white man's burden was that 
that uh, India had no uh, what you called uh, it is the duty of a white man to make the Indians civilized. Okay, as if Indians did not have civilization or past or culture. So they said it is the white man's duty, white man's burden to make them civil. That means what? They have to educate them. They have to teach them the ways how to live. They have to teach them what is truth and morality. They have to teach her what is the way of life and that. So now when new discovery this they brought, this Aryan link, now it helped the upper caste people. It helped the upper caste people, particularly the Brahmins, to what? Have put their head on high head on high and also claim some kind of a, uh, what you called confidence. Confidence. confidence against British. Okay. So now you can see what led to the social religious reforms is uh, led to the national movement or growth of modern nationalism is socio religious reforms so you can see that social religions reforms were very progressive and this progressive progressiveness helped many people to realize the backwardness and the evils in the society it also led to unify the people and also it raised raised what national consciousness So national consciousness was raised. So socio-economic, socio-religious reforms also was very important in raising the banner or of Indian nationalism or modern nationalism. What helped? We can see that middle class intelligentsia played a very pivotal role. They provided the impetus and also these middle class intelligentsia becomes the critics and also these people start to uh, make awareness about the ill effects of British rule and this middle class intelligentsia intelligentsia they became what? They are the uh, community where it provided leaders to which they provided to leaders for which movement? Indian National Movement an Indian national movement starts with what? Officially. The formation of Indian National Congress. Yeah. Okay. So Indian National Congress had leaders from this middle class intelligence here. So the what led to the the rise of modern nationalism in India is. The contemporary movements which happened in the world during this era, what happened in the contemporary movements? What kind of movements led? Contemporary world movements. What French revolution. Of, French, huh? French revolution. Uh, no, French revolution comes in 18th century, Bhagavad. That is in 1700s. I'm talking about Indian national movement comes in in 19th century, that is in 1850s, what happened? The later half of 1850s. In America, what was going on? Yes, so you can see that in the American continent, America has what a, how many continents? Two continents, South American continent, North American. So you yes. can see that in the American continents, you can see they were colonial empires. Who were colonial empires in Ameri in the continent America? You will have Spanish, Spaniards, yes, Spanish, Portuguese, English, were some of the major world colonizers. Against them, liberation movement started against the ruins of the Portuguese empire, Spanish empire in South America. Liberation. And later half of that, uh, uh, what he called in, yeah, you can see in, in the Americans also fought liberation against, in 1780s they fought. So you can see 
many countries started to uh, what you call fight and even in europe you can see liberation movements fascism young uh, movement young italy movement was started by whom mazini mazini so this came to india in 1820s you can see that henry vivian de rosio he took so you can see all that led to the uh, what you called uh, it brought enlightenment not only that you can see greece greece then uh, you can see ireland ireland was fighting for what their independence from the uk united kingdom which is controlled by the english so all these contemporary movements helped indian leaders how did they come to know they come to know with what information which was carried to them via what literature as well as first hand experience who got the first hand experience who got first hand experience that was shared to the indians who went abroad for what purpose study so the middle class intelligentsia leaders they got that ideas all penetrated into indians now indians also very much enlightened how they can fight the british so you can see british also in this time they got lost in the crimean wars the crimean wars they lost as well as you can see the there were peasant movements all brought lot of uh, what you call awakening in the indians to fight the british and finally you can see the reactionary policies reactionary policies of lord lytton reactionary policies of lord lytton also led to the what you called the um, rise of the indian national movement what kind of reactionary policies lord lytton did one thing he reduced the uh, uh, indian civil service uh, ics aspirants age from 21 to 19 years second he brought what arms act arms act 1878 he brought vernacular press act 1878 he also brought and he also committed what the the grand delhi darbar during this time the capital of india was where 1877 during this time the capital of india was where calcutta sir calcutta so though calcutta they wanted to give what delhi darbar and in delhi was the erstwhile headquarters of the moguls so that they wanted to show to the world that now their queen empress victoria is the queen empress of queen empress of india they gave the title they also gave another title kaiser e hind the title on bestowed on queen victoria on what background india was fa facing one of the greatest famines from 1876 onwards people thousands and lakhs and crore people died in this and you can see they were making merry transporting the food grains and they're showing the grandeur and pomp all the action so the actions of lord lytton led to the rise of indian national movement are you getting me yes sir is there any 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 doubts Subhasri, Swetha Mohan, Rahul, sir, like the excavation said, Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. That's uh, what I said. Rediscovery of India's past. Yes, European sir. scholars, I told you no. Yes, sir. Uh, that also brought, but uh, but there is no uh, what you called uh, thing called Aryan. No, they are doing. Yes, but aryan invasion led to the downfall of the 
uh, what you called the Harappa and Mohenjo-daro cultures. Sir. So now we go into the political associations before the starting of Indian National Congress. So most political organizations which started in the early half of 19th century were dominated by whom? Who dominated? The upper caste. So you can see the affluent, rich, affluent, upper caste. So all these category of people and their agenda, what was their agenda? Their agenda was very local and also it was very regional in nature. Yes or no? Did, did it have national consciousness? Also. So only when you find the International Congress founding, you will find a greater agenda and, and greater inclusion of people where people from urban areas and local rural areas all join. But these organizations prior to 18... 85 were all what they had very what you call local demands they were uh, what you called rich affluent wealthy people were associated and their demands were local and regional in nature so what were the main demands of these people what were the main demands Saurabh, what were the main demands of the free congress associations? First thing... Abolition of polygamy, abolition of sati, sorry, abolition of child marriage. No, that is all uh, the, the, the religious reforms, but pre-congress associations, the agenda of pre-congress association is what? They wanted administrative reforms. Administrative reforms. Second, they want Indians to be associated with this administration. They want what? Association of Indians. In what? Administration. In, in this administration. Third demand, they said, education. That the British government should take the onus of educating the Indians, spread of education. These were the demands of what? The pre-Congress association. Okay. And these associations were what? Were, uh, were formed for the interest of local and regional nature of the wealthy people, rich people, affluent people, upper caste people. Okay. First among institution which started uh, in the pre-Congress was from the associates of Raja Ramon Roy. In 1836 AD, you can see the associates of Raja Ramon Roy, they started Banga Basha Prakasika Sabha. So this started after the, the Brahmo Samaj. And, and uh, Raja Ramon Roy dies in 1833. So their associates who were very much influenced by Raja Ramon Roy's ideals in life, they wanted to take forward. So, what was the agenda in starting Banga Bhasha Prakasika Samba? Sabha? One thing was welfare, welfare of people and welfare of society. This was the objective of Banga Bhasha Prakasika Sabha. And what is the significance of Banga Bhasha Prakasika Sabha? So, Banga Bhasha Prakasika Sabha wanted to focus its attention to the uh, to the to the british that what indians are what are under disadvantaged position indians have grievances and please solve their grievances and also give them the remedy or what is the remedial measure you will take please tell us this was the agenda. What was the agenda of, of Banga Basa Prakasika Sabha? What's the significance? The Banga Basa Prakasika Sabha asked about the British. They questioned them that 
the english men we should focus your attention on the grievances of indians and also you should provide remedial measures for for those grievances for for that for the those problems you need solutions yes, okay the redressal of grievances pardon the redressal of grievances sir yeah redressal of grievances yes the second association we came was called as land holders society or zamindari association land holders society or zamindari association it also was started in late 1830s and the agenda of the zamindari association or landlord association is to the objective is safeguard the interest of the landlords and this zamindari association marks the beginning of what it marks the beginning of organized political activity so which is the first organization which wanted what organized political activity land uh, landlord association zamindari association or landholders society oh, yes, okay. so the next association is the bengal india society next association is bengal india society this bengal indian society was majorly it was formed for what they wanted to get all the information of the british subjects and disseminate this information to the to the higher officials so they wanted what collect and disseminate what is the situation of the indians what are the situation so that what you can plan welfare of people or welfare measures can be planned accordingly are you getting me please respond yes sir okay so later you can see the zamindari association and land holders association is amalgamated the land holders society or zamindari association plus bengal india society is merged together in the year 1851 and they form british indian association this british indian association uh, when it merged two association and formed in bengal you can see that it had it impact on the politics of india what impact so they demanded what is the uh, what he called the uh, outcome of this british indian association first thing they demanded what they demanded establishment of establishment of a separate legislature second they what is the second demand that this legislature what they have establishing okay so um, um uh, they it should be with popular character that means what popular character means what that people should be directly elected elected third the demand was separation of executive and judiciary separation of executive and judiciary fourth british indian association 1851 repeatedly asked the british government abolish abolition of various duties so what were the the uh, objectives of british indian association establishment of separate legislature 
and that legislation should have popular character with people directly elected, separation of executive and judiciary, and abolition of various duties. So, because of this, what happened? Because of all these uh, issues, government of India under the British, they were forced to bring an act from the Parliament of London. What is that? All the it did all the demands were accepted. No, all demands, but yes, major demands were accepted. And what is the consequences of these acceptance? We can see that British Parliament was able to legislate and send, and that act is called as Charter Act of 1853. In this, they got what? Now a concession. Earlier, the Governor General's Council had only three members, G Governor General's Council. That is, they have uh, member one, Governor General's Council one, two, and three. But because of this act, they got additional six members. That is, G4, G5, G6, G7, G8. G9. So you can see six members came additionally. So this got what? Indians got uh, the representation in legislative council. Are you getting me? Because I'm doing this pre Congress association because we can expect them in question or in the match the following. They may confuse, they may put some three, four ideas in this and they will confuse you so don't get confused so next pre-congress association was the east indian association this was formed by the grand old man of india dada boy naroji in 1866 in 1866 dada boy naroji he was able to put forward the plight of Indians. So he wrote the poverty and un-British rule in India and the main objective of British East, in, uh, the East Indian Association in England was what? For influencing the public in London, in England. And what he wanted to influence the people, he wanted to showcase that how British had systematically uh, what he called uh, uh, destroyed the Indian economy, how Indians have become very poor. So he wanted to see, uh, share the plight of Indians, plight and also promote uh, the Indian welfare. Who who wanted to the promote Indian welfare? That that was was so this is the first nationalistic Indian nationalistic organization in England. It is the first Indian nationalistic organization in England. Which organization? East Indian Association. Okay. Then you can see that You can see the next association is called Indian League. Indian League was founded by Sisir Kumar Ghosh in the year 1875 and in Bengal area. What was the agenda or the objective of Sisir Kumar Ghosh through Indian League? First, spreading political education among Indian masses. What was the agenda of Cecil Kumar Ghosh? What is the objective of Indian League? Spreading education among Indian masses. And when it spreaded this uh, political education, what was the reaction of our, when people heard these things? When people heard these things, it stimulated it did what? It stimulated a sense of 
nationalism among the people. What did it do when this information was disseminated and people heard it got a sense of patriotism, nationalism among the Indian people. So, Sisir Kumar Ghosh, Indian League, Bengal, 1875, spreading of political education among Indian masses. With this, it stimulated a sense of nationalism among the people. Are you getting me? Yes, sir. Understanding. So, next as, uh, what you call pre-Congress Association. Next pre-Congress Association is called the Indian National Association. Prior to this Indian National Association, the name, it now it is INA, but it was Indian Association of Calcutta, IAC. Indian, earlier name, Association of Calcutta. It's called IAC. So what happened? IAC, now it became Indian National Association. It was formed by Surendranath Banerjee and Anand Mohan Bose. Anand Mohan Bose was associated with which, uh, what you call the uh, social reform organization? Can anybody say? Sadharana Brahma Samaj. Correct. He was erstwhile with the Brahma Samaj because of the actions of Keshav Sandrasan. Anand Mohan Bose opened Sadharan Brahma Samaj with Sip Chandra Dev and Umesh Chandra Dutta. Okay. So Anand Mohan Bose was instrumental in putting the political organization called Indian National Association. Earlier it was Indian Association of Calcutta. So what was the uh, agenda of or, or what was the objective of this Indian National Association? The objective of Indian National Association is first thing they want to create a strong public opinion. Why did they want to create a strong public opinion? On what purpose? For what purpose? On what questions? On political questions. On political questions. Second, Indian National Association, it had a, the objective was it wanted to unify whom? You would unify all Indians in a common political program. What was the objectives of Indian National Association, Rahul? It created a strong public opinion on political questions and its objective was to unify all Indians in a common political program. And what did they significance? This Indian National Association, after seven years in 1883, what did they do? They conducted a national level conference. It was called as All India Conference. In All India Conference, who came? More than 100 delegates all over India. They all attended the uh, this conference in 1883. And this Indian National Association, it merged with Indian National Congress in 1886. What did this, what happened to Indian National Association later? Saurav? It merged with the INC in 1886, sir. Okay. Okay. Good. So, next national association was what? Pune Sarvajanik Sabha. So, Pune Sarvajanik Sabha was founded in 1867. And this Pune Sarvajanik Sabha was headed by Justice Mahadev 
Govind Ranade and also the other important personalities are S. H. Chipulankar. S. H. Chipulankar. Ganesh Vasudhyo Joshi and Justice Ranade. What was the agenda? So, Purva Sarvajanik Sabha, that time there was a lot of issues and there were Deccan riots. Okay. So, people were having a lot of issues. Their lands were taken over by the government. The Jamindari system failed. People were finding very difficult to pay the taxes according to the Rayatwari system, in particularly in the Bombay Marathwada region. So, this Pune Sarvajanik Sabha wanted to act as a bridge. It wanted to serve as a bridge between whom? Bridge between whom? Between the British, British government and the people. And what is the second agenda? First thing is to serve as a bridge. Second agenda is that they wanted, they wanted to popularize what? They wanted to popularize peasant rights. They wanted to popularize peasant rights. And this helped uh, uh, Mahadev Govind Ranade's activity. In 1879, they were able to uh, push the government, British government, and they passed Deccan Agri Agriculturist Relief Act. What did they were instrumental? Deccan Agriculturist Relief Act of 1879. What was the final achievement of Pune Sarvajanik Sabha along with other uh, uh, peasant leaders of Deccan? They were able to push the British government and Deccan Agriculturalist Relief Act of 1879 was passed and it gave a lot of solace and relief to the protesting peasants. Are you getting me? Yes, sir. Okay. So next association is called the Bombay Presidency Association. It was started by, it's a political organization started in 1885 prior to Congress and the leaders were Badruddin Tiyabji, Herosha Mehta, K.T. Tilang. And this Badruddin Tiyabji in 1887 in the Madras Congress session became its, its what? He became its what? INC session Madras. He became president. president. He is the first Muslim Islamic president. Okay. The next association is called Madras Mahajana Sabha. It was founded in 1884 in the Madras presidency by M. Veera Raghava Charyar, B. Subramanya Ayer, T. Ananda Charlu. They also had similar demands and political, they wanted to put on the government and also they wanted to present the grievances of the people and also assert in people in the British government giving remedies and also welfare of people is what the objectives of Madras Mahajana Sabha. Okay. So this uh, you can see what type of, these are the pre-Congress, major pre-Congress association. So what were the pre-Congress, uh, what you call campaign? So you can, you can see what were the pre-Congress, uh, the Indian Association. They also had All India Conference, 1883. Later, 100 delegates came and later it merged with Indian National Congress in which year? 1886, sir. In 1886. So the second All India Conference of uh, the INA, Indian National Association, was held in 1885. In the same year, we can see Indian National Congress. This turned in what you called 
in Bombay on 28 December in Gokuldas Tejpal Sanskrit Maha Vishwa Vidyalaya, we had the first session of Congress. Okay, so what were the, the pre-Congress campaigns? What were the pre-Congress campaigns? Pre-Congress campaigns. Are you able to see? Yes, sir. First thing, in 1878-79, there was a pre-Congress campaign for Indianization or in the Indianization of the government services or government service. Second pre-Congress campaign was against Lord Lytton's Afghan adventure. People protested because it was a huge burden and loss for the government. But it went on the ego and they went on the war. In 1878, there was a pre-Congress campaign against Lord Lytton's Arms Act. Fourth, in 1878, again, there were pre-Congress campaign against Varna Cooler Press Act. Fifth, they were what he called the pre-Congress campaign was it fought against the British and they were demanding for right, right to join what? Right to join volunteer corps or association. They wanted that right. Sixth, the pre-Congress campaigns were also fought against against whom? Against big plantation uh, what he called um, um, jamindars and uh, owners. Against what? They were against the plantation labor exploitation and also in land emigration act inland emigration act they fought there was a against labor exploitation against the plantation owners they had then another uh, what he called in 1884 there was a pre congress campaign they were supporting whom they supported lord ripens uh, Ilbert Bill. Lord Ripert wanted Indians to be equal with the with the British judges. So this created a lot of issues. Okay. And moreover, a pre-Congress campaign was done in London. For what purpose Indians went and uh, were done pre-Congress campaign in London? They wanted British people or Britain uh, citizens, Britain's people to vote for pro-India party to, to British government, to form British government, from British government in London. And pre-Congress campaign, we can see that they also fought against Lord Lytton's the uh, reduction in appearing for ICS, they wanted this age relaxation. They also fought because um, Lord Lytton had reduced from 21 to 19. And this agitation, what the people, uh, they organized an All India agitation. And this All India agitation is called Indian Civil Service Agitation. Are you getting me? What are the pre-Congress campaigns in 1878? Indianization of government services. 
there were pre congress campaigns against lord lytton's afghan adventure lord lytton's arm tag lord lytton's vernacular press act lord lytton's age relaxation and that became indian civil service agitation and they also fought against the the british to give them the right to form groups or join volunteer crops they also fought against the plantation owners who were exploiting the laborers and also they also fought against the uh, inland emigration act in 1884 pre congress campaign they all people supported lord ripon's ilbert bill and later you can see in london the britain uh, the, the pre congress campaign was started in london where uh, the britain's people were were influenced by the indians to vote for a pan a pro indian uh, party in in britain so that they will do justice to uh, the indians in uh, in india so finally you can see that all these congress campaigns it had also impact okay so now we will go into the foundation of indian national congress shall we take a break up to you sir yeah we will take a break and uh, after 10 minutes we'll join okay sir okay
welcome back rahul are you able to hear me yes sir no okay so now we will go into the foundation of the indian national congress party so you can see indian national congress uh, when it founded the the congress had what a broader agenda and a national level organization prior to congress we have seen all the organizations all the organizations were what all the organizations were national or regional regional they were regional and what was their agenda what was pan india agenda or they had limited agenda limited so now you will see congress forming the all india association and now they have a very bigger agenda so congress formation changes the politics of politics of india so when was the first session of congress held it held on 28 december in 1885 where was the session held it was held in gokuldas tejpal sanskrit maha vidyalaya in bombay and during that time who was the um, the governor general viceroy of india lord dufferin and the first session when it held it in bombay in 1885 who was the personality who chaired the um, congress session W C Venus. What is his full name? Gomez Chandra. Chandra Banerjee. Gomez Chandra Banerjee is a very eminent jurist and an eminent lawyer who headed the Congress session. But Congress was formed by whom? Congress was formed by Alan Octave Hume. and you can see that erstwhile uh, organization of indian national congress was formed in 1884 it was called as inu that means indian national union and this indian national union uh, later became indian national congress who made the change from union to congress it was through the efforts of dada by naroji it was dada by naroji who who asked the indian national union to change its name to indian national congress so that it will have wider reach and broader agenda so that is why they changed the name to congress so who changed the name of erstwhile organization from inu to inc who dada by naroji so in 1886 calcutta session of congress held now who is the president dada bhai naroji is the president of congress party so who took the initiative to integrate all the regional organizations into inc who took alan octave hume who was alan octave hume alan octave hume was a british civil servant he is an ics officer retired officer so he took the initiative in binding all the regional organizations of congress so what were the opinions of congress so you can see omesh chandra banerjee who was the first president of congress he remarked that that congress is the product of the brain of whom lord dufferin and lord dufferin wanted an organization for what purpose to gather intelligence how intelligence will be gathered pan india that people from different parts of the country will come and they will know what is the opinion of the british government what is the real intention people have and and that intention people will be Uh, what he called getting and he will bring compile all the intention and that intention they will 
make it into some kind of a law or some kind of a action they will take so that they will protect the empire which is uh, falling, which is crumbling. So this was the famous opinion of W.C. Manaji. Lala Rajpatrai in his book, Young India in 1916, he said that Congress, Indian National Congress is a safety wall. And British used this, uh, all the treasures of the British government, the Congress took and the British was relieved. So the safety wall theory was that Congress was formed to save the British and also to strengthen their rule. And grievance of people was secondary. And whenever Congress met, they, they used to bring in the people's opinion through uh, resolution. And these resolutions were passed and with majority. And these resolutions were what? Were useless. British uh, were not giving any reaction. Their reaction is very cold reaction to the resolution. <coughs> that means their primary objective is to save the empire. People's grievances and problems are secondary. Rajni Palmetat. Rajni Palmetat. Rajni says that Rajni Palmetat is a leftist thinker. He said that in his book called India Today that Congress is an agent of British. And he also accused that Congress had good what you call hold on the movements whenever people used to gather and, and when movements went to a peak, it used to betray the people. And all these movements fell down, crumbling. And he criticized whom indirectly? He criticized whom? Gandhian politics. Gandhian politics as well as the, the moderate face leaders, particularly the, the uh, Swadeshi and boycott movements were also brought abruptly. And also the second uh, mass movement called Home Rule Movement, it also came abruptly. So Gopala Krishna Gokhale, the political mentor, political mentor of whom? Gandhi. MK Gandhi. Gandhi, MK Gandhi's political mentor, Gokhale, he said, I accept the role uh, of formation of Congress in the year 1913. If we are not accepting the role of British, they would have uh, definitely banned us and we will not have INC and British was, were very instrumental in starting Congress. So you can see that British presence was there in Congress, particularly Alan Hockte Hume, he was the general secretary, along with William Wedderburn and John Jardine, two other two members of British in the Congress. And this Alan Hockte Hume was the founder or the father of Indian National Congress. He served as the first general secretary of Congress. So safety wall theory. So you can see that safety wall theory, that middle class intelligentsia, was very, uh, what we called, they were educated and they educated where? Mostly in abroad, in foreign countries, particularly in the West. So they were exposed to the liberal ideas. What were the liberal ideas? Liberty, equality, then uh, what you called freedom, all those things came with what? With the Western political thinkers. Who are the Western political thinkers? Particularly Voltaire, Roseu, Roseu, Milton, John, Tolstoy, all these people. And middle class intelligentsia have seen how Western political institutions, self-governing institutions, educational institutions, and various other innovations, transport, communication, Everything, it was working perfectly. They compared with Indian scenario how India was, was backward. So now we can see this. These middle class intelligentsia have a very fair, good knowledge of English. So they were able to articulate well. They could speak well. They could put a counter narrative. They can keep a criticism. They can 
uh, write a article they can write a, a book they can publish against them knowledge of english what provide impetus to the national movement moreover these middle class intelligentsia are, are also qualified people because they prepare for civil services but most of them failed due to the harsh eligibility conditions and criteria which was laid but whatever they learned to prepare for civil services they were able to target the british government with that knowledge so britishers were now facing a new kind of a scenario where educated people are questioning who have already exposed to the in western uh, culture western institutions western mode of thinking now they are what finding difficult so what is the agenda so and these people are now starting organizations and these organizations are putting a what uh, a lot of pressure of the british government they are creating opinion on the people they are gathering people all over the country so now these britishers got threatened what did british do what did british do british thought that why don't we bring all these middle class intelligence everybody into one forum into one organization and when they come we will we, uh, what you call ensure that all the energy is spent only in this organization not in the voice or creating opinion or the dharna or organizations and we will put politics in them so let this fight people fight inside pit one against other one against other so what will happen when one against other is there they will fight who will become the president who will become the vice president who will become the general secretary who will become the additional secretary all those things and they'll fight and all the energy will be spent uh, in this so now british has brought congress as a what safety valve theory so that safely they will divert all those negativity which the middle class intelligentsia would have spent in creating opinion against masses now they will put all those things into congress and now whatever the threat was there that will be neutralized and these people will be kept busy in this forum called indian national congress and they will be busy engaged in this politics so this was the agenda of the british and this is what lala rajput rai says safety wall so potential threat to british came from whom from the middle class intelligentsia they organized rebellious movements and also they framed popular opinion in the public by writing in the newspaper press and they were the ones who were the first editors publishers printers they are from using the printing press and wherever they spread this idea all those area it rose in revolt against uh, against the british rule so british was finding difficult so that is why they wanted all these potential threats into come in one platform and this platform was nda national congress and what is the agenda of british divert their attention so congress was created for the benefit of people or benefit of british rahul british And sir british why because if you would have left these intelligentsia class people they would have what would have they would have done they would have used all the energy they would have garnered public support with what with press with uh, literature uh, with uh, meetings uh, with dharnas and also they would have uh, gone in what they call protests so all these would have put pressure now you create international congress an organization and you bring organization politics now these people all these intelligence class will what will work for congress and they will indirectly bring that uh, issues to 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 whom to british through political grievances how in every year in congress they will make resolution and this resolution will be taken to the british and british will say what whether to give them good concession or british will come to know the intention of people one way they may give some peace meal what is that if there are 10 demands they will give only two and rest a demands will be denied and once it denied what they will do they will they will bring new contrary laws to safeguard 
to safeguard the empire so in this way british uh, also will have one hand intelligence will be gathered they will have the sense of opinion at the same time they will neutralize the threat of these middle class intelligentsia now congress will be the forum for them where they will come and spend all their energies and now they will cut their energies from garnering public support so this way british was very calculative in forming the congress so british wanted every issue to come to them through the in the form of resolution where in the resolution there will be grievances they will frame policies certain policies they'll give to people solution and certain policies there it is all intelligence that these people wanted to do this that so ultimate objective of british was to save the empire strengthen the empire grievances of people and other issues which is facing hardships are secondary to the british so now middle class intelligentsia agreed so that english officials will join the organization why english officials will provide what english officials when they come they will also will bring some kind of a credibility to the indian national organization so that british government will not uh, what you called uh, see indian national congress as a threat so that is why british officials were allowed now officials having a upper hand who were there so moderates were having an idea that without the british officials british government will not let the congress to function and it is not possible to keep this organization or form this international congress the reason is that congress will attract the the wrath of the british or it will attract the force of british when you include these british officers the british government and british will be very less suspicious because british also involved and they will know that they will get the first hand information so in this way congress was allowed um, uh, to have the uh, westerners particularly allen octave hume who is the general secretary and the father of the international congress william wedderburn and george jardin are the first members of the indian national congress party they attended all the first second and third sessions so with the help of english officials now the middle class intelligentsia who formed the core or the nucleus of of the um, what you called the uh, indian national congress they want to take the british government into their confidence and air their public uh, what you called grievances their political grievances economic grievances to them so that they will be what british government will give some kind of a solution or they will bring welfare measures so this was the agenda of the early congress moderate faction leaders so moderate faction uh, leaders had their agenda and their agenda was that they wanted to raise basic questions and this basic questions were what regarding what basic questions they were regarding the nature and the purpose of british rule nature and purpose of british rule when they asked such questions now they clearly understood the fact what did they clearly understood moderate faction leaders that the british imperialism they made indian issues subordinate british ensured that indian issues are subordinate that means they had their own agenda which is primary to them and and british wanted only what the economic instability of india and economic progress of britain that is the only agenda so you we can see moderate slowly started to uh, include this with the help of the english officials now slowly the middle class intelligentsia are having an upper hand so now but when british officials started to come the middle class intelligentsia is using the forum to create a narrative against the british so the third session of congress international congress held in madras and badruddin tyabji who is also the first uh, what you called 
the president, uh, Muslim president of Congress party. And earlier he was in the, the Bombay Presidency Association. He was also founder. So he became the Indian National Congress president in 1887. So the fourth session of Congress held in 1888 in Allahabad. So what was the causes for the formation of Indian National Congress? Rana Rajpat Rai um, uh, and others also put the theory of safety wall theory. And this safety wall theory is that the rise of middle class intelligentsia was a threat to the British because after 1857, they became very politically active. And now they are framing opinion, they are creating organizations, they are protesting. And now they are, they, they are now having uh, what you called some kind of an agenda, which is though it is regional, they are creating some noise. And the, the, the activities of Lord Lytton gave more impetus to formation of the, the International Park Congress, an all India organization, because Ilbert Bill controversy, Lord Ripon wanted Indian judges on par with European judges, but Wilbert Bill controversy created an uh, issue that Europeans didn't like the way Lord Ripon has brought a new law. And they wanted to ensure that Lord Ripon should be taken back to England. So they put so much of pressure and all the Europeans joined together and ensure that this Ilbert bill, what was proposed by Lord Lytton, where an Indian judge can try a European, now was amended. And this amended uh, was not even passed. Directly it was implemented, it became a law. And now people got to know that Britishers, even without uh, what you called passing that amended thing, directly they passed the law in their favor to safeguard their own interest. It demonstrated to the Indians that Europeans had their purpose. What was the purpose? If there is one issue which is threatening their existence, they will all be united for that cause. Indian cause, justice and other things are all secondary for them. Now the primary thing is what? To safeguard them. So now Congress, when it formed, slowly it also understood the, the nature of the British rule. And they also started British Committee of Congress in England, in London in 1890. And this British Committee, a branch of Congress called British Committee of Congress in England, in London, they started a publication called, journal called India. In this journal, like East Indian Association of Dada by Naroji, it also, what you called, took uh, to the streets of London, where people, London citizens will be knowing how British has treated the Indians, how they economically, they have destabilized the country and Indians were made to suffer. Indians were tortured and Indians' wealth was looted and brought to their home country and to spread the plight of Indians among the Britain, the citizens of Britain was the agenda to create a global agenda against the British rule. So what were the objectives of INC? Indian National Congress establishment gave an opportunity for the middle class intelligentsia to come together and form an all India level organization. Now they have greater inclusion and this inclusion was what? All sections of the society were coming, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, every uh, middle class intelligentsia, foreign, westerner, everybody. Now they are getting a more traction, wider agenda. So now political literacy among masses is slowly starting to spread because Congress was conducting their session. First, they conducted the session in Bombay. Second, they conducted the session in Calcutta. Third, they conducted a session in Madras. And fourth, they conducted a session in Allahabad. And you can see that wherever they're conducting sessions, People are coming to know presidency, though not in major number, but yes, some kind of attractions they are getting where people are now becoming understanding the politics and they are becoming politically literate. Reach to people from all parts of the country and to at attain this reach, they were uh, uh, sessions were conducted and held in different parts of the country. So the fourth session you can see was held in Allahabad. So 
in calcutta session in 1990 bro unna adhula da irukare nam naalai tha attend pananom ketna per va audambi so you can see that fourth session of congress was held where fourth session of congress was held in ilahabad later in 1990 calcutta session kadambini ganguli becomes the first women graduate of calcutta university and this women graduate kadambini ganguli was 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 made to address the indian national congress session why because congress understood that without the support of women and without the support of the larger masses and rural we cannot proceed so women were also started to be given an opportunity to come and join congress from 1890 and kadambili ganguli became the first women to address this pan indian organization and this inc it became a secular organization and and it brought hindus muslims christians parsis buddhists jains everybody into this jews into the into the organization and whenever anybody has some kind of a uh, what he called um, that there some majority of hindus are saying this is not good christians are saying not good muslims are saying such issues they will they are objecting they will not pass that resolution if it is hurting any one particular community so moderate phase so moderate phase starts from 1885 to 1905 in moderate phase you can see who were the moderate leaders you can say omesh chandra banerji surendra nath banerji sn banerji surendra nath banerji then you have ferosha metha ferosha metha dada binaroji ramesh chandra datta anand mohan bos gokhale gopalakrishna gokhale moti lal ghosh madan mohan malaviya dinsha vache mahadev gobind ranade who is called as justice ranade all these were tallest leaders of the indian national congress in the moderate phase so what were the ideology of uh, what he called the moderates we can see moderates they were they wanted everything what very slowly that means it is gradualism and everything they want to do in the four walls of law they don't want any agitation so they want what constitutionalism they don't want any other thing apart from constitutionalism and moreover moderates never wanted freedom they never thought about freedom and they wanted what british to bring and make india a liberal society they want a casteless society and they want gender equality they want what this is the most important thing for them for the moderates what was the most important thing greater representation on council so their agenda was what politics their agenda was politics they want to sit in the in the in the seat of par that is becoming member of parliaments and also becoming legislative council member and that will be a something prestigious that was a major agenda but secularism discrimination no discrimination all things are minor agenda but greater agenda is what they want to sit in the council that was the main agenda for the moderates so congress had middle class intelligentsia support they brought in the liberal thought and most of the delegates were from urban areas but there was a weakness in congress that congress did not have any connect did not have any connect means they were what they did not connect with the masses or with the rural population because they did not take the cause of the peasants or the or the lower caste people or the issues which is plaguing the vast majority of indians they do not do so mass politics or nationalism national concern there is no only in the gandhian era you can see mass character rise during the the moderate phase and extremist phase you can say the greater mass connect was not there so 
the moderate faction of Congress, they didn't believe in what? They didn't believe in the violence. They didn't believe in um, in the, they wanted Satyagraha. They wanted, the crux is that moderates did not want freedom. They wanted the British rule to continue and they wanted some kind of a concession and they want to be within the British system. And there was no idea of changing the system, no idea of uh, the independence of freedom in them. So what was the idea of a moderate faction on British rule? They said, we cannot leave, Indians cannot leave. The reason is that India was not a nation. Why India was not a nation? They know if British rule is not there, India will become what? It will be small, small what kingdoms. It will break. So they wanted British rule is must for India to keep, to keep united. British rule, they will help us to bring local self-government. They will develop high-class political institution. They will bring the, the um, upper house, lower house, and also give representation to the Indians. And also they will bring industries and make industrialization how they made England rich, Australia rich, New Zealand rich. They will also make India rich. This was the daydream of whom? Who dreamt? Moderates. Moderates were dreaming. So if British are not there in India, what they said? There will be lawlessness. That means what? Every region will break. Everywhere there will be chaos. There will be anarchy. They, India will go into what you call the dark age and there will be no progress, no enlightenment, no new awakening for India. So British is good. Why they said British is good? Moderate faction, they glorified British. They said what? British are what? Great people. We cannot defeat them. We cannot. British government and British crown, the ruling uh, party and crown are very righteous people. They are very peace-loving people. They are very liberal people. Is it so? Is okay. British are righteous, loving, liberal people? No, sir. So then what did the moderates do? The moderate faction leaders, the middle class intelligentsia who are headed by the upper caste, particularly the Brahmins, they said that Indians are what? Indians have, the issue is, problem is social and economic backwardness of India. Is social and backwardness a, a problem of India or it is a British created problem which made Indian economically backward? So, and also the the uh, the moderate faction leaders said that it is because of reactionary policies of this Indian, Anglo-Indian bureaucracy we have. But who is the root cause of all evil? The British, because they systematically looted India, as well as their economic exploitation of India led to the such a backwardness. Our country was stagnant without, they de-industrialized the country without any progress. They destroyed the handicrafts, they destroyed the artisans, they destroyed the local industries, they brought cheap products. In this way, they monopolized the Indian economy and balance of trade was in favor of the English. So the moderate faction leaders had twofold solution to this problem. What was the solution? How? So how uh, you can put political pressure on bureaucracy, which is headed by Anglo-Indian group? So you can see that we have to pass, we have to come every session and grievances will be taken in the form of uh, what you called uh, uh, an idea. That idea will be passed as a resolution. That resolution will be taken and given to the British and they and we'll put pressure on them to implement a solution. For what? For that, they did what? They started a committee called in British Indian Committee in England. And this committee published a journal called India. In this, they were also showcasing the issues which is plaguing India and who led to the uh, Indians in such a plight. They wanted to create a narrative and as well as they wanted to uh, what you call, uh, uh, showcase it to the people of Britain and awareness to the, the British citizens that India has been devastated by the British rule. So Dada B. Naroji, when he became the president of Indian National Congress, second session in Calcutta, he gave a very sarcastic and a very critical uh, lecture on his address to the 
participants he said very sarcastically blessings of the british rule and he brought the experts from his book that poverty and un british rule which was written by him poverty and un british rule so with this he was able to showcase to the leaders how british have systematically destroyed the indian uh, industries and also made india backward the economic backwardness made indians to go into the poverty now now the methods of congress in moderate phase moderate started a new method what were there prayer petition persuasion three methods later this was enlarged it was prayer petition representation deputation and persuasion what are the modus operandi of the moderates rahul prayer petition, petition representation representation deputation Dep and persuasion so you can see moderates had demands what all demands moderates had political demand economic demand and administrative demand and with this you can see the the moderate faction leaders had political demand what were the political demand their major agenda of whom the moderate faction leaders is what getting into the legislative council and make this legislative council more representative that means what election should be held all over india they should elect indians and they should be going into the uh, what he called into the council so that elected representatives will become the leaders of the masses and they will uh, will will take the issues and present it to the british and now they are demanding greater decision making powers to the council which is represented by indians and also they put pressure on the british government that governor generals uh, the governors in the in the states or in the presidencies executive council indians should be included in the executive council of the governor general viceroy indians represent should be there so did the uh, um, british government heed to these demands fully rahul no, sir. no. no sir. so what they took some of them and they gave some concession and some they reserved so what were the economic demands they brought demand that abolish salt tax reduce excise duty impose import duty on british made goods which is coming from england to india reduce the land revenue tax in india investigate into the frequent famines how britishers were responsible for bringing poverty as well as uh, what you call food grain short, uh, shortage hunger and disease in india which led to famine they said please investigate and give us remedy and solution and also you reduce your military budget and and that reduced budget money which is surplus is there you bring it and put bring welfare measures so that our people of india will be benefited so what were the administrative reforms the moderate faction leaders asked they said repeal the press vernacular press act repeal the arms act and and uh, icas exam should be held uh, what uh, uh, to be held in india as well as in london simultaneously greater post and promotion for indians set up the military college similar on lines of london here in india so that our indian soldiers will also will be trained in large numbers and they will get promotion and separate judiciary and executive so these were the demands that slowly they put now these demands are slowly becoming what torturous to the british so they took some concess they took some and they gave what they gave some concessions to indians so the officials who were there uh, they were allowed to be their british officials now when the moderate faction leaders put all these things and organized where they are coming now the uh, what you call dafrin was finding what they were finding difficult now they wanted to gather intelligence bloody fellows they are coming up with agenda and they are putting uh, fixing the british so now they are been 
what you called fumed by the, the demands and official stance. And now they are creating British Indian Committee and all those things are moving in all direction. Dufferin now wanted to stop all association of the British officials with Congress. So then Lord Dufferin started to what propagate and he started to criticize that Congress is a microscopic minority of India. They don't have national character. They don't represent the will of India. He attacked the character of Congress. So initial phase, government officials were allowed, but later phase, Indian National Congress session, they were not allowed. So after fourth session of Allahabad, the, the foreign, uh, what you call British officials were forbidden, they were prohibited from attending the Congress parties, uh, uh, annual sessions and involved in their organization. So government also started an agenda. In this, they started to use Sir Syed Ahmad Khan. They wanted to suppress Congress. So Syed Ahmad Khan vehemently, he criticized Congress and not only that, British also gave money to Syed Ahmad Khan and he formed United India Patriotic Association. Not only that, in 1888, to give impetus to uh, Syed Ahmad Khan, in 1888, the British government in London, with the efforts of Lord Dufferin, they bestowed the title called Sir. That means what? Knighthood. Knighthood was presented on whom? It was presented on Syed Ahmad Khan so that he will take up the anti-agenda uh, uh, Congress and they will destroy the Congress and he formed the United India Patriotic Association to be a what? Anti-Congress agenda platform. So in this way, British has tried to weaken the Congress and destroy the Congress. So British media also started to report that the demands of Indian National Congress are illogical. So some facts for prelims. The fourth session of Allahabad was held in Allahabad. George Yule is the European. So he is the first European president of Congress and non-Indian. So during this time, you can find all anti-Indian governor generals coming. Lord Lansdowne, he was there from 1888 to 1904. And Lord Garzan from 1899 to 1905. So you can see four major pamphlets were printed and disseminated uh, it was uh, what you called uh, it was distributed and information was disseminated to the people one was called moderate faction agenda against the british criticizing the character of british officials rising tide an old man's home a, a conversation between maulvi fakhruddin and one ram baksh of kambatpur at tamil congress cat catism these were the four major uh, pamphlets which criticized the character of British officials. So later you can see moderate faction leaders, they were able to bring some kind of changes. So what were the assessment of moderate leaders? Extremist leaders, that moderate faction turned extremist leader, Bala Ganga Adar Tilak, he termed the methods of, of moderates, prayer, free, petition, representation, deputation, and finally, persuasion as political mendicancy. They never agitated. They always within the four walls of law. They want only constitutional. They want only petition. They want to go and beg. They wanted to go and request and, and pass resolution in Congress. Whenever they want their prayer, they'll take, but the reaction is cold. So he called this method as political mendicancy. So Balagangadhar till like, question the ideology. And ideology of, of the moderates was that capitalism by British is good. Industrialization are good. British water, they'll, they'll bring us industrialization, Indian economy. When they will be again reviving it, British are very strong. They are world empire. We cannot defeat them. So this ideology, what people now, extremist faction within the Congress are disapproving. So what were the achievements of moderates? So the achievements of moderates is that first, they were able to, uh, what you called, criticize the economic policies of British imperialism. So, economic critic of British imperialism. Second, the, the demands put by the moderate faction 
they also got amended the Indian Council Act of 1861 and which led to the passing of Indian Council Act of 1892. Third, moderate faction leaders were able to sow were able to sow the seeds of nationalism in the people of India. And moderate faction leaders also popularized the ideals because they were all Western educated, Western political thought, the ideals like democracy, liberty, and equality. And finally, Gokhale, Ranade, all also brought some kind of a social reforms with legislations proposing uh, what he called the issues which is plaguing India, particularly the supported widow remarriage and imposed widowhood by the society. They opposed and asked that this imposed widowhood should be removed and they should be married off. And also, they also were against child marriage, polygamy and female infanticide, which was still prevalent in the, the uh, 19th, uh, uh, end of 19th century and early 20th century. So, the first session of Indian National Congress, they were also able to pass resolution against Indian Council Act of 1867. Consequently, they get some concessions in 1892 uh, Act. And later, they were successful in creation of Public Service Commission. In 1886, Atchison Committee was formed. British Parliament also passed a resolution. So now we can see that exam of ICS in India and UK was done. Uh, simultaneously, but this was not given uh, immediately, but only in later instances because of continuous pressure Indians got. So, Welby Commission was appointed to look into the public expenditure. How much is the income? How much is the, is the expenditure? What has been spent on the Indians' welfare? And also, the, the moderate faction leaders were able to successfully highlight the economic drain theory, particularly Dada Bhai Naroji, uh, Ramesh Chandra Dutt, they showed the reality to people that British had drained the resources of India and moderate faction leaders wanted to be within the constitution. They never wanted uh, freedom, but they wanted uh, some kind of concession. So slowly some kind of political maturity is coming into the masses and now leaders are taking up that issues. So Public Service Commission 1886 Atchison Committee was appointed to look into the problems of civil services and also the age or, or relaxation which they are demanding in the for the civil services aspirants. What were the recommendations of Atchison Committee? Atchison Committee said that the exam cannot be held simultaneously in India and Britain. There are certain issues, but they gave some concession. They said the minimum age uh, uh, which was there, <coughs> maximum age 19, they said now it will be made 19 and they increased it to maximum 23 years. They can write it. So that was a victory for the moderate faction. So statutory civil services will be abolished. Now the services of rich people, affluent class, which were earlier recruited, will be abolished. That was the concession the moderate leaders got. So shall we stop here? Okay, sir. We'll stop here because uh, uh, tomorrow we will start from the extremist phase and then we will go into the revolutionary terrorism and then finally we'll go into the Gandhian era. So, what you do is that you go and uh, read. I'll come in the literature every three, four days. All the materials will be sent to you. Okay, sir. Okay, please go read it and I will send that uh, timing, so please join and uh, and uh, I will I'll also dis I'll discuss the previous questions along with this. Okay. So thank you. See you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.